just want to take a brief moment to introduce our, our guest speaker this uh, for the weekend, um, Pastor Kiala Thompson, <laughs> is uh, from Hawaii, is actually Hawaiian, so um, uh, native Hawaiian, that is. <laughs> And uh, he and his, his family is here, his wife um, and uh, daughter, and we are so thankful that they are joining us. They have a ministry, it's called the Loud and Clear Call Ministry. He pastored for 15 years in Hawaii, and then in 2009 they started the ministry, and uh, uh, the Loud and Clear Call Ministry that they've been doing since then for now over, over 10 years. And um, then they also have the Healing Rain, which is a school, that heals uh, people physically, emotionally, and spiritually that they, um, that they work with uh, people. So um, we want to welcome uh, him this weekend. I asked him, so when I saw him, I said, you know, um, so you say aloha. And he said, no, we say aloha. Can you all welcome him? <laughs> Is that right? Okay. <laughs> we hope you feel welcomed, and we are so glad that you're here, and we look forward to what uh, God is going to share um, through you to each of our hearts uh, this evening and over the weekend. We have program uh, meetings tomorrow morning for those watching online. We'll be having Sabbath school and church here, and uh, then in the afternoon at 4, and then in the evening again at 7 o'clock. We hope that you're able to join us at each... Um, at each time we are able to gather God's Word. At this time, we have a special music by the um, Washington Hills College Women's Corral.
I'm very happy to be here with you, with my family, and thank you, Rob, for the introduction. And um, a good um, introduction to aloha. So <laughs> we normally say aloha to each other like aloha, but in a greeting, we normally say how um, Rob did it. So he warmed us up for us. That's a good job. So we're going to do it again. How's that? So you just kind of repeat after me. So I go, aloha. Wow, that's good. I feel very warm, like I'm in Hawaii right now. I feel <laughs> on the inside, so thank you. That's relaxed me. So inside of your program, you know there's going to be handouts. So each presentation, there's a handout. So can you look for tonight's presentation? It's entitled Sexual, Sexual Integrity for Women. Sexual Integrity for Women. Now, you're probably thinking... Sexual integrity for women, is there ever such a thing? And um, pretty much everywhere I go, people have told me they never heard a message like this before. So I want to prepare our hearts for this message. And it's from the spirit of prophecy and the word of God. And I believe, you know, God, everything he does for us because he loves us. What do you say, amen? amen. And because he loves us, he wants us to be happy. Those who put Christ first, last, and best, Ellen White says, are the happiest people in the world. What do you say, amen? amen? And I came from the world, I came from the bad scene of dating scene and horrible relationships, and I was very miserable. And I'm telling you, it looks like it's fun, it looks like it's happiness, but you look at all the people out there, they're very miserable. And, but if you follow God's way, you're going to be happy. And I want to be happy. Who wants to be happy out there? Let me see your hands out there. Amen? So anything God tells us is because it's for your happiness. Why? Because as a father, he wants what's best for his children to be very happy. And that's a loving father. A loving father wants, loves his children. And, you know, I have a daughter, and, you know, I feel that being a parent is harder than pastoring. Can I hear a big amen? Amen? In today's world, man, being a parent is very hard. It's not easy. Pastoring to me is very easy compared to parenting. So my heart goes out to all the parents out there and um, to all the students here. And, you know, just be patient with your parents, young people, because, you know, we're doing the best that we can and it's very hard. So pray for your parents. What do you say? Amen? Amen. Turn me to John chapter 4, verse 13 is our opening text. John chapter 4, verse 13 is our opening text. And in the handout, Sexual Integrity for Women, Before we begin, will you pray with me? Father, we humbly kneel, we humbly ask for your presence and that you may speak. Please grant freedom. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, men and women both struggle with sexual integrity, just in different ways. It's an urban legend that says that women do not struggle with sexual impurity because for every man that... Um, commits adultery or every man who commits fornication, there's always, or most of the time, there's always a woman that commits fornication and adultery with him. Is that not correct? So the thing that is only the man's side to struggle with sexual integrity is not true. We're going to find out that there's different roles for men and women. And the reason why there's different roles is because we were created differently from our creator. Do you know that? Do you know that men have way more testosterone than women? Ten times more. You know that women have way more estrogen than men? Which means that if God the Creator created us, and that's why He allowed these different roles, if God created us with different roles and we have different body and different chemistry and different hormones, it means that Satan must know this too as well. He knows what hormones we have, what we don't, what's higher and what's lower. And also that we were created differently from women and women were created differently from us, then that means that we must also have different temptations. And yet, it's not really talked about. And so we're going to be focusing on a different challenge. And the reason why we want to know, okay, we're going to focus on the men tomorrow, but I thought I'd start off with the women first. <laughs> but with the women, you know, we're, we're created with different hormones, and um, the struggle is definitely real in a different way. And the reason why you want to know is because whenever you go to like a battle, like a certain thing, you want to know like what is your weakness, so you can focus on not falling in that weakness so you can then gain the victory, right? If you don't know what your battle is, how are you going to gain the victory if you don't even know what your battle is, right? So we're going to focus on that tonight. So let's look at the 
woman at the well, John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. And let's see, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I should give him will never thirst, but the water that I should give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus is offering this water to this woman that's going to satisfy every longing of her heart, fulfill every desire of her soul. But I want you to notice that was the woman's response to this offer. She said, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. So this woman, she, she wanted this water. And I think I want some water too. Yeah. <laughs> At least I'm on water here. You know, in Hawaii, it's very humid, so when I come here, my, I get kind of dry here. So <laughs> the water. So this woman, she wanted this water, and this water was something that would satisfy the deep longing and thirst of her soul and to really desire it. And so... She really was hungering for this. Now, if someone was hungering for something, for, for truth, for present truth or truth, and said, please, give me this truth, what would you do? Would you give exactly what they're asking for? Wouldn't you do that, right? Let's look at how Jesus worked with this woman. She said, give me this living water. Now, notice what, this, what Jesus did. He said, Jesus said to her, he didn't answer her question directly. He said, Jesus said to her, go what? Call you what? And come here. <laughs> Wait a minute here. She's, beg she's begging him. She said, Jesus said, I have this living water. She's, she says, please, sir, give me this living water. I want this water to satisfy the deep longings of my soul. And then Jesus says, go call your what? Is that answering the question? Maybe. Could it be? Now, what is he talking about, go call your husband? What do you think he's trying to do? What do you think he's trying to do? Help her share her faith. Help her share her faith. Okay. Reveal her real need. What's her real need? What, why are your husband? Because he didn't have a husband? She had five husbands, and the man she's living with was not what? Her husband, so she's living in sin, right? Shacking up, right? So what does this say about her? She's trying to find happiness in relationships, in men, right? In humans, right? Are you seeing what he's doing here? So mom, you think, oh, present truth. I need to give him present truth. Are you following me, right? I need to sit down by what study I am. Uh, now, it's good, the 2300-day prophecy. What Can you hear a big amen? amen? Amen. But the person streeting with personal brokenness, oh, let's sit down and study the 2300-day prophecy. Are you following me? Jesus, went, Jesus knew how to deal with someone's heart. So he went to the... He, yes, she wanted truth. She wanted the truth. But instead, he said, let's go, and I want to go call your husband. Why? Because he knew that unless she would move... In order for her to move forward in her spiritual growth, she first needed to deal with the emotional brokenness in her heart. Is that not true? Is that not Christ's method? So he went one way he went to deal with the personal issues of her heart, inside of her heart. And so that's what Jesus did here. And uh, this evening, in order to truly fu be fulfilled by Christ, you must first deal with your present and your past sexual integrity. Can you have a big amen? Amen? The brokenness, the relationships of her life. And then she could experience true healing. This woman was fighting a battle she didn't understand. You know, and she was struggling. And Satan knew how to attack her. And she was losing this battle. She was not happy. She was empty. And she was longing for it. And Jesus felt, okay, you need to understand sexual integrity and the steps of emotional and sexual affairs that you've been having and to heal from that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the first woman in the Bible to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Please turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to look at the temptations. But we're going to look in, at these temptations through the eyes of sexual integrity for women. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. What happened here in the Garden of Eden? Notice the Bible says, 
Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay, And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? So the first thing is that a serpent here. And what is the serpent doing? The four steps of attack to the woman. First step, what is the serpent doing? He's what? Okay, okay be before the doubt. <laughs> what is he doing? He's what? He's, he's talking, right? So can serpents speak? No. So this is an unreal medium, right, that he uses to tempt this woman to fall, right? So I want you to notice that this woman, Eve, if, Eve, if Satan was to pick off the fruit from the tree and say, hey, Eve, he goes, yes, here, catch. And she grabbed the fruit and said, eat this fruit. How many think that Eve would have eaten a fruit from the beginning before Genesis chapter 1? I mean, chapter 3, verse 1. No, because she, was, she loved God. She was loyal to God, right? And she would obey God and do everything because she really loved him. So what Satan had to do is he had to get into her mind, right? He had to change her mind first. And once he changed her mind from Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 5, and then verse 6, he was able to get her to fall. If that's clear, let me say amen. Amen? amen. So for women, attack is he attacks them by first an unnatural, unreal medium is the first step. Okay, and the second step here is what you said, that he got her to what? Doubt, right? Doubt the word of God. So Satan, the second step of attack for women is that he gets you to question yeah, your current situation. Question everything about it. Um, a spirit of questioning. The next step is in verses 2 and 3. What was her response? The Bible says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she believed strongly in the core values, and she did not want to displease God because she loved him. Now, Eve, it goes on here in verse 4 and 5. What was the next thing, the third thing? It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for not God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like what? God knowing good and evil. So the third step is that Satan was making it look as if you eat the fruit, you're going to be like what? So what is he trying to create in your mind? That if she eats of the fruit, she's going to be like God. In other words, there's something out there that she's missing out upon. Right? If she'd only eat this fruit, then there's something out there that would be really good that she would actually reach that realm, almost like God, right? Like God-like experience, like I'm missing out. So if you eat this fruit, that's the third temptation that Satan brings to women. A dissatisfaction, a desire for something more than what she currently has. Eve believed a lie. She felt that she was missing out on something better out there and thus became dissatisfied with her current situation. And then what did she do next? It says here in verse 6, the Bible says, So when a woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. So in other words, as soon as she saw that her mind was changed in all these different ways, and then she took out the fruit, and then she ate. So recapping the sequence of Satan's attacks, Satan uses an unrealistic false reality as a tool to get Eve to sin. Number two, put questioning Eve's mind concerning her present condition. Three, Satan led Eve to believe that she was missing out on something better out there, that she was missing out upon her. She was dissatisfied with her heart, with God, to be dissatisfied with her life, to be dissatisfied with her husband, decide, dissatisfied with her emotional needs. Number four, Satan then came with the temptation of making the forbidden fruit look attractive so that she saw that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desire to make one wise now we talked about the battles between men and women men struggle more with the eyes and the physical and we study that tomorrow women struggle more with the ears and the emotional and so satan knows that just like eve there's modern eve today who get tempted in the same way so if you have your handout i want us to look at something what it says here. 
about sexual integrity. It says here, first line of attack is using unrealistic mediums, okay? So notice what it says here, Councils on Sabbath School Work 21. It says, thousands are today in the where? Insane asylum. Insane asylum is insane asylum, losing with the mind, right? Mental illness. Whose minds became unbalanced by what? Novel reading, which results in what? Air castle building and lovesick sentimentalism. Now, you, I know it's kind of big words here. <laughs> air castle building. Okay, what is air castle building? Okay, so think about the words. Air means like it's up in the air. They're fantasizing. They're imagining. They're daydreaming. Does that make sense? Castle building. Okay, let's think of that word castle. Now, when is a castle? What, do you, what is a normally... What's normally, to make a castle wonderful, what do you normally need? You need a what? A prince, right? And besides a prince, what else do you need? A princess, right? Is that not true, right? So you, you have a woman who actually, like, say, uh, say there was Cinderella, miserable experience, and what she wants, she wants some, who does she want to come? She wants some prince, charming to come, right? and sweep her off her feet, right? <laughs> and um, brought off into the eternal sunset, right? <laughs> to live what? Happy. Well, you can finish the sermon. When is, I can just walk down. <laughs> Happily ever after, right? So what Satan uses, he uses these movies. He knows that women struggle with this, more so because of the high estrogen. So what he does is the emotions, or he plays with the emotion, he plays with the, the fairy tales, the stories that they've grown up, and he uses unrealistic mediums of Disney movies, right? Of animals speaking, right? And he uses it to actually, it almost like it escalates it, the problems within the person. So he wants the love romance movies. He wants the Disney movies being saved out of their pitiful condition. Imagine something better out there, right? to be swept off their feet, to live happily ever after. And so the battle with women is that they battle with this struggle of longing for something that they don't have. Look at another quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says here, You have been injured by reading love stories and romances, and your mind has become fascinated by impure thoughts. Your imagination has become corrupt until you seem to have no power to control your thoughts. It's like you, you start running off with these thoughts and imagine about this guy that in your class, you know, and it's almost like it escalates it. I, have a, I had a church member when I preached this in a church. She came up to me and said, Pastor, you're so right. I can meet a guy for the first time. I'm already imagining what it's like to be married to this person. <laughs> <laughs> I have other people tell me that every guy that walks in and like, is that the one, you know? <laughs> we talked about it this morning. You know, we talked about, remember we talked about the four, right? The four things that why, why Adam was created, right? And in the right, correct order, right? And what was the first thing that God wants you to establish? He wanted Adam to establish and he wants you to establish. He wants you to have what? Relationship, Relationship with? God. With God first, right? And the second thing we found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, what was the second thing God wants you to establish first? Was what? Okay, a life calling, a life work, Right? Again, the third thing that God, and then after that it happens, right, in Genesis 2, 22, right? 3, 22, 22, to have what? Then you get what? Okay, then you find a, a life partner, right? You get married. And the last thing happens in Genesis chapter 4, right, verse 1, you have what? Children. Then you have children, right? And so the, Satan wants to destroy that. And he wants to speed it up. And many times you may even understand this is the right process for working it out, and you explain it to me clearly, but... Sometimes he may cut it short because he knows what your weakness is. And though there are many young people who have even understood these principles, but he destroyed their lives. You know, if you, you can be happy with right, the right person if you marry the right person. But many people, Satan deceives them and it makes them fall. All it makes, takes is one wrong mistake and it is like you can be living in a living hell. Is that not true? And so you have to be very careful 
of the person that you And what Satan's going to do is, many times people fall into relationships and we ask them, how do you get there? And say, how do you know what happened? It just happened so fast. And I think if you don't understand how you tempt it and how you fall, you can easily fall into this. And so these, these movies of romances, novels, and you know, that you read, and movies, and love stories, and sitcoms, and, and romantic comedies, right? And it may not be now. Praise God you got the victory over that. Hey, amen. But you know, it may have been in the fairy tales that you're raised up when you're growing up, right? And it kind of like, it kind of like magnified the temptation to do this. She goes on and says, Day and night dreaming and castle building are bad and exceedingly dangerous habits. When once established, it's next to impossible to break up such habits and direct the thoughts to pure, holy, elevated themes. You will have to become a faithful sentinel over your ear, eyes, ears, and all your senses if you control your mind and prevent vain and corrupt thoughts from staining your soul. The power of grace alone can accomplish this most desirable work. Can you hear a big amen? Amen? They have their imaginations perverted by novel reading, daydreaming, and castle building, living in an imaginary world. They do not take up the light burdens which lie in their path and seek to make a happy, cheerful home for their husbands. They expect themselves to anticipate their wants and to do for them while they are at liberty to find fault and to question as they please. This is what happens when you get married. If you continue to have this mindset of you know, daydreaming and castle building, and you know, all this, this is what happens when you get married. These women have a lovesick sentimentalism, constantly thinking they are not appreciated, that their husbands do not give them all the attention they deserve, they imagine themselves martyrs. Christian martyrs, Christian present truth martyrs, like I sacrifice everything for the ministry, you know, and look at me, I'm sacrificing all this for him, I am the food police for him, I'm the spiritual police, I'm the sexual police, I'm everything for them, I sacrifice everything for them. I deserve something better than this and how I'm treated. And so the next temptation, then you on false media, and what they do is, Satan gets you, the second step, he gets you to question your current situation. Man, I'm not happy where I'm at. I'm not happy not only being married to this man, but I'm not happy being single where God has called me to be as a student. Are you following me? I'm not content. And so Satan comes just as he came to Eve to tempt you that your situation is miserable, Right? It's a horrible, just like Cinderella, it's a horrible, I'm mistreated by my stepmother, right? I'm, and you feel like, whoa, I'm a martyr, I'm suffering, I'm, sa I'm sacrificing everything here, and, and I can't have this relationship, and I'm, look at my situation, I don't like it. I'm not content where you're at. Second temptation. And the third is that, so to like point out there, to be as God, there's something out there, there's someone out there that you're missing out upon. That if you just long for something and you just daydream about it and think about it, then actually it will make you happy. Satan is playing with Eve's mind. And so it's not fantasizing and thinking about other people. You start comparing maybe your boyfriend or husband with every other man, whatever. And whenever she does this, he always comes up short. Comparing them with other people. And you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Comparing, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not what? Wise. Wise. They're missing out on something. Comparing their self, what their husband has done, she's entitled for something better. Someone who can meet her needs the way that she deserves. And then finally, the last part is that then and only then, once he makes you think that way, like kind of like the, almost like he's playing out like Cinderella in your mind in real life on false medium, and then you're like, you're dissatisfied with your current situation, something better out there, and then, and only then, right? Genesis 3, verse 6 comes, and then that person that Satan has in his mind comes along your way. You're not happy with your current situation, it's a perfect person, and you go toward that direction, and then he kind of plays, and he's a player, he kind of throws words out there, he kind of makes you fall for him, and actually your emotions get sucked up, or maybe it's an innocent thought, Maybe it's just a thought that he didn't mean anything by it, but you took that one thought, and this happens a lot, and actually you run with it. The next night you're all thinking about how much he likes you because he said this one word to you, hi. 
And you're like, wow, you're running like, oh, hi. And the next, <laughs> you're thinking about him the next day, right? I call it emotional lusting. Sexual lusting for men, women is emotional lusting. You know, you think about how attracted their neighbor is because he's so funny, unlike their husband. <laughs> how have, how you'd be like to be your co-worker you work with at school who satisfy your emotional needs, unlike your fiance. They dream about your classmate who is so intellectual stimulating, unlike your boyfriend. <laughs> Someone who is spiritual like the elder, right? Unlike the person you thought was the one. So Satan comes and he makes you long for something else and he plays with those different things. Now, a temptation is not a sin. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow, especially for the men. Just because a temptation of you desiring someone, that's not a sin. Do you know, Jesus was tempted, right? Was he not, right? But, but did he sin? So the very thought that flashed in of a temptation does not mean that's a sin. When lust conceives, right, you're kind of dwelling upon it and thinking about it in your mind, that's when it conceives and becomes a sin, right? So don't get, some people think, oh, I thought the thought. Just the thinking of the thought, oh, I might as well give in, right? That's not how it works. No, you have the thought, you know, claim the word of God, right? And then the thought will flee. What do you say, amen? amen. So, one of the places I speak at is at a uh, youth conference in Southern California, and it's for inner city youth of Los Angeles. I'm one of the speakers of maybe like 10 speakers. And they want me to speak on relationships. And I shared this presentation. And I remember speaking at this group of uh, young people. And one by one, they're walking out of my sermon. And the women would just got up and just start walking out. And it's very humbling. If, how many of you ever walked out of your sermon? <laughs> very humbling. Like, okay, they didn't like my sermon. It must be my presentation. I don't know what it is with my presentation. So I said, okay. And it was, wasn't just one. It was like several of them. Next week, I was speaking at another church in Los Angeles and uh, Loma Linda era. And I was, this happened as someone was sitting in the next table for potluck, and I said, they came to hear me again. And I said, Oh, come over. I'm sitting by myself. Come over with my family. So they came and sat with us, and I was talking with them. And then she said, I was here last week at your meetings. I said, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, I don't even know this, but I actually walked out in your sermon. I go, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you walked out in my sermon, okay. And she said, yeah, I need to tell you what happened. And I said, what? I said, I couldn't deal with your messages on your sexual integrity for women. It was so painful to me of what I've been doing in my life that I couldn't hear it more and the Holy Spirit convicted me so much I had to walk out of your sermon. And I went in the bathroom and I just started crying and bawling. Before I could reach the bathroom, I was just bawling and crying. But she said, I went into, this interesting ha thing happened is I went into the bathroom and I was crying and then when I was in the, in the restroom, the, there were other women there and they were crying as well. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like weeping and they look at each other and she said to them, are you here because of Pastor Thompson's seminar? And they go, uh -huh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what happened? They all went in a circle, and they had a little prayer session at that time. <laughs> so you don't know what happens behind the scenes, right? <laughs> you may think, I'm a total loss. I mean, it's a total, it didn't work at all. They didn't like a message at all. And God, many times, he's going to hide the results from you, right? Keep you humble. But sometimes he's going to say, you need to he hear this. You didn't see that actually what is happening here. And they say, you know, Pastor, we never heard anything like this. And this is the message I need to hear because I want to be sexually pure for my husband in the future. What do you say, amen? amen? If you think about this, if you think you created a habit of daydreaming and thinking of guys all the time, and sometimes not only one guy at a time, sometimes it's three, four, five <laughs> guys at a time, right? <laughs> at this, another conference, I was speaking teenagers. They're walking and... and one of the other speakers said he was following these teenagers, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds, and they said, wow, Pastor Thompson's sermon is just speaking right to me. It was as if he was reading our minds. <laughs> and uh, I always tell my daughter that. I said, Anya, tell me the truth. <laughs> I said, look in her eyes and say, I can read your mind. <laughs> and in the beginning, it works. She goes, what, what? 
<laughs> but now she knows, you know, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we know this is a real subject. And think about this. If you know, if you're doing this and it become a habit, you, I don't want to say this is a very hard habit to break, like almost impossible. But what was impossible with man is possible with God. What do you say, amen? <laughs> now, this is as impossible as this. Man, think about this. Your struggle with sexual integrity physically is what their struggle is exactly is emotional lusting. Think about how intense that is, yeah? So with that struggle, think about it. If you're doing this now with daydreaming about men, do you think our malady is going to disappear once you get married? That's the question. And so many people, even Christianity, if they're not dealing and heal from it right now, they bring that into their marriages. And they think, oh, because I'm a Christian, everything's perfect. But because they never dealt with it, they didn't even know what the attack was anyway, they never dealt with it, they never healed from it, and they bring it to the marriage, and then there's problems within the marriage. So your preparation for a good marriage in the future begins now. What do you say, amen? amen. That's definitely a victory that women definitely need to work on and to heal from, just as men need, as we're going to talk about tomorrow. How many of you want the victory? Let me say amen. Amen? Amen. 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 The woman at the well, let's go back to her. John chapter 4, verse 28 to 29. John chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. What did the Samaritan woman believe Jesus? Why did the Samaritan woman believe Jesus was the Christ? It says here, 4, verse, John 4, verse 28 and 29. It says, The woman went, then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? In other words, here was a man who knew everything there was about her, all her um, struggles, her emotional needs, her emotional struggles that she's gone through. And yet he still loved her and was talking with her, right? And that's what gives us the victory. Because there is one person who understands what you're going through. What do you say, amen? <laughs> Women, and that's Jesus. And he knows that struggle and he, he understands that the struggle that you've gone through and he can understand and he understood this woman. She was so moved that she told the whole city and the city came out to Jesus. What a wonderful story. What do you say, amen? This is amazing how, and you know women, when you experience sexual integrity and healing from your brokenness and your past and emotional lusting and everything, God can use it in a mighty way. This woman, can you imagine this? She went to the city. She didn't even get one class on how to win a soul. And yet she brought the whole city to Jesus. And some of us are taking class after class after class, and we haven't even brought one person to Jesus. Could it be that maybe that there's something deep in the recesses of our soul that God wants to bring out and bring healing and purify that and have purity, and then God can use it in a powerful way? What do you say, amen? You know, you never know the far reaches of what you share. Um, I was in AFCO a couple years ago, and I was teaching classes. And um, just posted last week, somebody posted on Facebook for all to see. And they say, you know, I struggled with pornography until Pastor Thompson gave a class at AFCO. And I tell you this day, it took me a while, but I had victory over this sin. What do you say, amen? <laughs> it takes... It takes strength, it takes a strong desire. It takes knowledge to know, first of all, what you're doing is wrong, right? Because if you don't know what you're doing wrong, then Satan has got you, and you're going to fall into this trap over and over again. And he wants you to experience his victory within your life. And men, it's good to know this, because if you know what the struggle is with women, then you're going to be careful more with your words, right, to call out their affection. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying, like, I don't want, like, no one talking to each other in the cafeteria, okay? Because what you got is very beautiful. I really believe that, that there's a really good spirit of unity here, which I really appreciate that. Um, which is a praise to God. What do you say, amen? amen? But at the same time, you know, men, that you don't want to call out for someone's affections. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow, especially for women. Remember the temptations with 
with, with the ears, right? And with the emotions. So, God loves us with an unconditional love. And at the cross, when Jesus was up the cross and the soldier poked his side, out came what? Water and blood. And this water was meant to satisfy the deep longings of our soul. What do you say, amen? So men, and you know, there's an overcross, there's an overlap and a crossover where men struggle with this too. Not as strong, but it's there. Example, I remember when there were like TV shows watching, like um, they're watching like a romance comedy or like, a, you know, a, oh yeah, soap opera, okay? So, so at a soap opera, when I was young, I was only like 12 years old and um, there's this girl, uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but there's a girl that I liked and I couldn't get to her, so they were all talking about soap operas. So I said, okay, I'm going to watch the soap opera <laughs> so you have something to talk about, right? So I was like watching the soap opera, and I'm like, man, this is so boring, you know? And then I can't believe I'm watching this. It's so horrible. I just can't believe it. And then after a while, like, I go to school as I'm talking to her, and she's like, oh, I have something to talk about because, you know, she watched soap operas. But, you know, after she left, nothing happened. I mean, this, you know, puppy love or whatever it was, Anyway, she, she, um, she had left, got, she was older than me too, so I don't know, it was a crush. <laughs> and then she left, and then, you know, after she had left, I was still watching that soap opera. And like, it kind of can, you know, it can, we, like we have it in the men have estrogen, by the way, do you guys know that? And women have testosterone. So it's there, but it takes a while to warm up, right? It takes a while for men to get emotional, right? It takes a while. So, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> We're sensitive, right? It's there. Somewhere in there, it's there, right? So, um, in the same way, like, I remember, like, you know, you see, like, the TV show, like, romantic comedy. You want to watch the movie? Oh, no, I don't want to watch, right? And then you walk by, go, mm, okay. And after a while, I'm like, oh, wow. You know, you kind of look in there, get a little more caught in. At the beginning, it's not really interesting. And so, um, this is a battle. There's a crossover. You're going to find out, even with, with women tomorrow, they struggle with the temptation that men struggle as well today. But this, the cross reveals that the blood of Christ, he died for you, but this water came out after the cross. So in other words, it was meant for us to drink from this water from the cross. And as you drink this water from the side of Christ on the cross of Calvary, that will fulfill the deep longings of your soul. What do you say? Amen? Amen. See, many times, we're going to talk about this tomorrow morning for worship, for divine hour. Many times, the struggle that men and women both struggle with, and all addictions is not primarily set upon the addictions. The addictions are just the symptoms. We're going to study about root causes tomorrow, reading from cause to effect, and then what it says. So addictions are just the symptoms. The symptoms are there to tell you that there's a root cause over here, there's something in your past that you need to heal from, some brokenness. That's why, you know, you have alcohol addictions. That's meant to numb the pain. Now, the people say, I'm drowning my sorrows, right? It's not kind of pain, they're numbing. Even Jesus on the cross, there was, he was in pain physically, emotionally, right? And spiritually on the cross. What did they offer him to drink? Vinegar. To what? Numb the pain. But what did he say? No, he didn't. He went to the cross fully feeling every pain on the cross for you and me. Why? Because he loves us. What did he say? Amen. He died on the cross, men and women, so he can you can be satisfied. You can drink the water from the cross and your soul can be satisfied with the deep longings that only Jesus can satisfy. If you're looking for love in a person, that person will never fulfill the longings of your heart. There's only one person in this whole universe that can fulfill the deep longings and desires of your soul and that person's name is Jesus Christ. What do you say, amen? amen. And that's why it's very important to develop that relationship and there's any longing for emotional bonding or emotional fulfillment or whatever is in your heart, it must be fulfilled in Jesus and Jesus alone. I want that. How about you? What do you say? Amen? amen? You know, for every counterfeit that Satan has out there with Disney and everything and Cinderella and everything, that means that there must be a what? A true. Right? Does that make sense? Like a real. So, according to the Bible, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Jesus Christ is a true prince of peace. What do you say? Can somebody say amen? Amen? amen. Who in Revelation 19.11 is riding on a 
white hearts. Can someone say amen? Amen? amen. To come and save us in Galatians 1 verse 4 from this pitiful and evil world. And take us into Revelation 21 verse 3 to ride off together into that eternal Hawaiian sunset, might I add. <laughs> of Revelation 22 verse 5 to reign together forever and ever and ever. Amen. I left some, just some promises, just some covenant challenges. Can we do that? Yeah? Just to the women. Now, you can say amen loud or you can say it in your heart, okay? But I just want to challenge you about these six covenants. Can we think we can try that? What do you think? Okay? Okay. So, the first covenant I asked, number one, is covenant. Women, ain't no men too, right? Because this overlaps. Covenant to ask God to speak to you of his love to you. What do you say? Amen? Amen. Covenant. Covenant two. Covenant two, by the way, is based upon God's promises to us because we can't keep the promises of God, right? Because our promises, otherwise says, are like what? Ropes of sand. We break them all the time. So it must be based upon the new covenant. God writes his law in the heart, right? He changes us from the inside out, not just externally going to the motions, but have a new heart on the inside. So covenant number two, to ask Jesus to reveal to you that he is your only true Prince Charming. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Number three, covenant to stop reading all romance novels from watching all soap operas, romantic comedy movies, romance comedy sitcoms, and Disney movies. Ouch. Ouch. Somebody said, when you hit Disney movies, you know, that really hit a, a, a sore spot with me. <laughs> but this is something to think about. And what it can do, it can escalate. If you're dealing with it, this is really a, a struggle with you, and you can't gain the victory over your, this sin, there's something to really pray over. Okay, I know it's a hard thing uh, for a lot of people, but if you believe this, can you hear someone say, amen. amen, amen? Four, covenant to cast down your impure daydreaming and castle-building imaginations. Can you hear someone say, amen, amen? Five, covenant to capture your rehearsed scenario thoughts and bring them to the obedience of Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen? Amen. Six, covenant to escape from your imaginary world back into the real world. What do you say? Amen? Amen. amen. And that's the challenges. They say it takes three weeks for a new habit to happen, but with sexual habits, it takes at least six weeks so to put new newer pathways within your mind. You know, there's some things that you can do. I put on there. Face and experience healing for your past hurts. You know, because if you're numbing your pain, so sexual addictions can be used as a way to numb your pain. Food can be used as a way to numb your pain. We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning, right? So if you look at that, if you just, ex now you need to come and gain the victory over all these addictions and sins, right? But if you don't deal with the root cause, you're going to just jump to another addiction. Does that make sense? And it may be a socially acceptable addiction. We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning. But I want you to think about that. So you must face and deal with your, your hurts. You must bring it to God and heal from that. Two, read and think upon the love God has for you, especially on the cross of Calvary. Can, can you say amen? Amen? Third one, change your diet. Now, do you know your diet can feed your animal passions? Do you guys know that? So you can feed it where like your estrogen levels can go up and down and very emotional. You can balance it out based upon what you eat. So your diet really affects your hormone levels and balances out also, even when you're older. So your, your diet plays a major role in overcoming the sin. Four, allow God to take you through suffering as this is the means here to bring you victory. You know, the Bible text says that uh, Jesus, can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, Jesus, learned obedience through the things that he what suffered can you imagine god himself had to learn obedience on this earth how he allowed suffering to come into his life and he didn't get bitter at it but he allowed the suffering to refine his character refine his fire right Isn't, who wants now we all while we're going through it we don't all want it but when we are going through it, it's the greatest blessing when we look back. 
I don't want to push away God's refining fire of trials. How about you? How many of you guys want to go through the trial that God allows? Let me see hands out there. Right? Painful as it is because you love the one and trust the one who's taking you through it. So God wants us to be physically, mentally, spiritually pure in our relationships. And we must not allow anything to come between us and anything in our lives so that we can have a relationship and to love the one who loves us unconditionally so we can love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want that. How about you? Amen? You want that? Would you kneel with me tonight, please? Father, we grateful that you love us so much that you gave your son who gave his life and his life that he can fulfill the deep longings of my heart and everyone's heart here, the emptiness of our souls that only you can fulfill. So Lord, we look to you and we love you and we're responsible for loving us first. And because of that, Lord, we want to serve you we want to make you happy. We want to please you in all things. And we want to just save our hearts for the one or the person you have for us in the future that you're preparing at this time. And so, Lord, we thank you. Hear the hearts of every cry here tonight, everyone who's crying out for victory in this area. Lord, you can do all things. And we know that we, if we trust in you, you will transform our hearts from the inside out. Thank you, Lord, for our hearing and answering our prayers. We thank in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Watsita Hills Academy and College for our weekend program. We sincerely hope that you've been blessed. To continue spreading the good news, you can go ahead and subscribe to this channel and make sure to click that notification bell so you know when we upload our next video. You can also check us out on Instagram and Facebook. The links to those can be found in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we hope that you have a blessed Sabbath.